Welcome back, everybody, for the third and final part of my State of the Civilizations 2022 series. So if you haven't watched the first two parts yet, definitely check them out. Their links will be in the description below. For a quick recap, as we bring in the new year, I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to take stock of the 39 civilizations currently in AoE 2 DE and see where they are right now in terms of both design and balance. And then for the sake of comparison, we'll rank the civs by placing them in a tier list. I outlined all of the tiers in part one, so before before we start our final leg of the civilization tour, I do just want to remind you guys that these videos take a ton of time and energy to make, so if you are hyped for this finale, please be sure to drop a like and comment and let me know what you guys think of all of the civs we discussed today. Now that we have achieved maximum self-promotion, it's time to get back to the civs. First up today is not just a classic Age of Kings civ, but also my all-time favorite, the Mongols. Naturally, I love this civ and I think they are one of the most well-designed and balanced out there, but there is is one small issue I have, and it will be enough to relegate them to the almost there tier. So Mongols are the original nomadic cav archer light cav -y civilization, and they were the only one to be designated as a cav archer civ by the game until we got the Tatars when DE came out. Still, what most people will remember about the Mongols in AoE 2 is their lightning quick openings and their amazing late game, and by extension how the civ has very little in between. For their openings, Mongols possess two of the best Dark Age bonus bonuses, their faster working hunters, and their extra line of sight for their scouts. The faster working hunters give the Mongols so much early game food that they can almost always get to feudal age well ahead of their opponent, and the extra scout line of sight ensures that they find all of their resources quickly, see where their opponents are located, and possibly push in some deer or lame an enemy boar. The laming part I'm not a big fan of, but that is a different topic entirely. Of course, after this early power spike, the Mongols don't really have anything going for them for quite a long time. They've got no eco bonus, and their only military bonus is faster firing cav archers, which is great, but it's quite difficult to afford cav archers in mid game without an eco bonus. Just look at Magyars. Mongols do have some nice mid game tools with camels and even arbalests, but still, you are likely worse off than your opponent during the castle age to early imperial age. Still, if the Mongol player can hold until late game, that's where their Mangudai unique unit comes online. I'm sure I don't need to talk about these guys, but the Mangudai possesses the speed, range, and bonus damage versus siege units, and overall just one of the highest damage outputs of any unit in AoE 2. On top of that, Mongols also possess speedy siege weapons with their drill unique tech and tanky hussars as a meat shield slash raiding unit. So all of this is great, but what keeps Mongols back then? Is it because Mangudai are OP? Nah, I think they're fine, especially after their slight movement speed nerf a while back. Is it because they're too strong on maps with lots of hunt? Nope, I just think that those sorts of maps are inherently imbalanced. So what does that leave us? The Nomads tech, of course. The Mongols Castle Age tech, Nomads, costs you 300 wood and 150 gold to not lose population space when your houses, TCs, or castles are destroyed. Yeah, that's really underwhelming. It's not like Mongols need an amazing Castle Age unique tech, but it should be something better than that. Overall, the Mongols are just such a classic AoE 2 civ, and I know I'm not the only one who loves playing them. They have options on pretty much any map type, but aren't particularly dominant in any one of them, with the exception being BF team games and the aforementioned hunt-centric maps. All they need to be complete is just a bit of a better Castle Age unique tech. The second civ today is another Age of Kings original, and that will be the BFF of the Mongols, the Persians. A good civ all around, Persians are nevertheless in a bit of an awkward spot, being overshadowed by all of the other strong cavalry civs, so I think a something is off placement is totally appropriate here. So in game, Persians are classified naturally as a cavalry civilization, which is pretty darn spot on. The civ has the most complete stable in all of AoE 2, being the only civ with access to fully upgraded hussars, paladins, and heavy camels. Of course, on top of that, they have the big boy Chonkmeister unique unit, the War Elephant, which is always a fan favorite. Some people think that they're too expensive to be viable or whatever, but personally, I think they're fine. War Ellies are a situational super late game unit that is nonetheless viable in closed map team games. Beyond the whole cavalry thing, the other main aspect of Persians is their fantastic economy. This comes in the form of all both of their civ bonuses, their extra starting resources of plus 50 wood and plus 50 food, as well as their super mega TCs and docks that have times 2 HP and progressively faster work rates. These two factors of cavalry and economy complement each other quite well, as cavalry is expensive and needs a strong eco to support it, particularly them elephantos. But beyond cavalry and booming, Persians do have a few other tricks up their proverbial sleeve. They have access
access to gunpowder as well as top tier trash units thanks to their fully upgraded halberdiers, hussars, and kamandaran crossbowmen, which can be upgraded to cost only wood. The only costing wood thing here is doubly great because one, it turns crossbowmen into a trash unit, which is just great, but in addition it means that you can balance a late game trash army with the wood only crossbowmen and the food only hussars. Of course, where the sieve is really going to be famous is on Nomad, where their extra starting resources allow them an instant fishing ship. Nevertheless, the sieve is still strong on pretty much any hybrid map, as well as pocket and team games. Unfortunately, there is something off with the Persians, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what it is. Like I said at the start, the sieve just feels so overshadowed by the other strong cavalry sieves that are just a little bit faster with night rushes or possess powerful bonuses to the cavalry units themselves. Persians get their team bonus of extra damage versus archers, but beyond that, the sieve has absolutely no military bonuses. Yes, their economy is great, but their faster working town centers do need a little bit of time before they really start to pay off. Because of this, Persians are only middling on both open maps like Arabia, as well as closed maps like Arena. Again, it's not that Persians are bad, they have situations where they totally shine with Nomad and Hybrid maps, a distinct identity as a sort of all-rounder cavalry and economy sieve with some fancy units like War Elephants and Trash Bows. It's just, I don't know, kind of like Magyars, it feels like something is missing with the Persians. Moving right along, we now turn to our other newest civilization, the Poles, who entered the game alongside Bohemians with the Dawn of the Dukes expansion just back in August of 2021. Like their Czech brethren, the Poles are actually a reasonably balanced and interesting civilization, but also possess a couple of tricky areas, earning them a spot in the Something is Off tier. Like Persians, Poles are also classified as a cavalry civilization. This is certainly accurate, although as we'll see, Poles go about the whole horsey clippity clop thing in a very different way. First and foremost, the most obvious difference you will notice when playing as the Poles is how your economy is set up. Instead of mills, you get your full work unique building, where adjacent farms instantly give you 10% of their maximum food. For example, if you have horse collar researched, farms normally have 250 food, but if you place that farm next to a full work, it will then give you 25 of that food immediately and then leave you with another 225 to farm. In practice, this gives Poles a fantastic boom potential, but at the cost of requiring them to place their farms around full works, leaving them much more exposed to enemy attacks. On top of the full work, Poles have another eco bonus with their stone miners generating gold in addition to stone. The rate is one gold for every two stone they mine, and this gold is immediately deposited into your stockpile, much like a Khmer farm. Over the course of a game, this will give the Pole player a good deal more gold than their opponent, and is a deceptively powerful bonus in general. So with Poles having a great economy, what do they then do militarily? Well, they are a cavalry civilization, so that will likely be your go-to choice. Schlachta privileges in the Castle Age reduces the gold cost of knights by a whopping 60%, meaning your heavy cavalry will only cost you 60 food and 30 gold to train. That's the same cost as a samurai or a jaguar warrior. However, this powerful discount is offset by the lack of the plate farting armor technology and paladin. This gives Polish heavy cavalry a similar feel to goth infantry. You miss some important upgrades, but your power units are so cheap that you're often able to outspam your opponents. Meanwhile, the Poles Imperial Age unique tech, Lechetic Legacy, gives their scout line trample damage, although this is only 25% of their attack instead of the flat 5 damage of cataphracts or Slav infantry. So why do Poles only fall into the something is off tier? Well, overall, I do think that the Civ is interesting, but they also have some noticeable problem areas. Their main unique unit, the Obuk, is able to strip the armor of enemy units and is overall really tanky and powerful. Even after the recent nerf to their creation speed, I feel like the unit is a little overbearing in many situations, particularly when combined with the stone bonus, which also feels a bit overtuned. Finally, Poles find themselves in an awkward situation where they are good on most land maps, but they aren't really nearing the top tier in any particular setting. Like Bohemians, Poles are in an overall solid spot, especially for being such a new sieve. There is a strong framework here with the sieve's identity of cheap, spammy cavalry, strong economy, and a fairly broad tech tree. They just need a little bit of refinement to smooth out the rough edges. Next, we go to Iberia for the final civilization of the African Kingdom's expansion, the Portuguese. These guys are one of those civs that have always been in an awkward spot, although I do actually think they are coherent enough to at least sneak into the somewhat problematic tier. In-game, the Portuguese are classified as a naval and gunpowder civilization and share many similarities to their Iberian sister in the Spanish and even the Italians. First, the navy aspect of this civ is quite clear, as literally all of their civ bonuses, both of their unique techs, and even their Caravel unique unit can come into play on 
on water or hybrid maps. Compared to other top tier water sieves, Portuguese are going to be the high unit quality and cost efficiency option. This comes at the cost of a strong eco bonus to help get you ahead in the early to mid game, but if you can hold on with your extra tanky and cheap naval units, you'll find yourself with arguably the single best post-imperial age on maps like Islands, Archipelago, or Migration. Although I definitely have issues with several of the specifics with Portuguese on water maps, I do think that broadly speaking, the Civ's niche is quite clear. On land maps, Portuguese are going to prefer more closed maps like Arena, Black Forest, and Hideout. For both 1v1s and team games, these closed maps give Portuguese the opportunity to get to their extremely deadly post-imperial army of gunpowder monks and halberdiers, and often incorporating their organ gun unique unit to sort of anchor down a push. Of course, all of the units I just mentioned are quite slow, which becomes an issue on open maps like Arabia. To further exacerbate that issue, Portuguese don't really have anything to help them get ahead in the early game, leaving the Civ feeling somewhat generic in their gameplay. And this brings me to the issues with the Portuguese. In most cases, the Civ feels either really gimmicky or really generic. One of, if not the biggest factor here, is their unique building, the Feitoria. This Imperial Age building costs 250 gold and 250 stone, and takes up 20 population space, but infinitely generates a small trickle of all resources. These trickle rates are fixed and do stack on top of one another, with the building generating food the most quickly, followed by wood, gold, and then stone. Quickly is a very relative term here, as the rates are much slower than the equivalent 20 villagers. This means that the use of the Feitoria is very specific specific, you only build them when you're either going for a fast Imperial Age strategy, as it becomes the best way of adding economy, or in a super long game when the resources on the map run out. This latter case is most prevalent on water maps, where the land is limited and wood especially runs out quite quickly. This leads to the absolutely horrible dynamic of the Portuguese player just camping their base with their navy and strong defenses, and just waiting until their opponent runs out of resources. You might think that that situation would be quite rare, but it's really not. It's just so incredible incredibly unfun to play against, and has led to some real buzz kills in several high-profile tournament matches, most notably the Hidden Cup 4 finals between Jordan and Hera. So yes, Portuguese have a lot of issues. In my opinion, Feitorias are inherently broken with their current design, as they will always be either completely overpowered or useless with nothing in between. Beyond that, the passive or situational nature of their remaining bonuses and units can make the Civ feel really generic in many other situations. Still, Portuguese can be really fun to play, and unlike the Civs in the major changes needed tier, they're never going to feel awful to play in any of the common game modes. Now we get right back to Age of Kings with our next civilization, the Saracens. This Civ has really the dual identity of being both classic and problematic, and with all of the changes we've seen over the past few years, I definitely say they currently end up in the something is off tier. Speaking of identity, the in-game Saracens are classified as a camel and naval civilization, and although the Saracens certainly do both camels and navy quite well, there's really so much more than just that. In particular, everything that this Civ does revolves around their unique economy bonus, which is all about the market. First, Saracen markets only cost 75 wood instead of 175 wood, so it's just much easier to incorporate the building into your early game strategies, but where the real show comes in is their exchange cost only being 5%, as opposed to the usual 30% or 15% with guilds. Okay, that probably sounds confusing if you're not familiar with the market in AoE 2, but in practice this really boils down to Saracens being much more comfortably able to balance their resources to serve whatever need they have at that moment. This is helpful at all stages of the game, but especially in Feudal Age, when you can easily sell your stone to get a quick Castle Age time, and then in the very late game when you're starting to bottom out the market prices. Moving on to things that are much more straightforward, Saracens are the original Camel Civ, with their particular traits being extra HP thanks to their Civ bonus and Zealotry tech, as well as the high damage potential of their Mameluke unique unit. So yes, this Civ obviously does Camels very well, but it's far from their only option on land maps. Saracens are one of only two civs that get a 100% open archery range tech tree, with the other being Japanese, and their archers even have the deadly team bonus of gaining an extra couple damage versus buildings. Beyond that, the Saracen tech tree is incredibly open, with the only important units missing being the Halberdier and Cavalier. Now, as to why Saracens don't quite make it higher than something is off, we have to look at a few different issues. First is their Mameluke unique unit, which is just way too expensive for what you're getting. 85 gold a pop is extremely high for a 
unit that dies pretty hard to archers and even regular camels, so you really only get to see these guys in late game team games. I know people complain about the concept of a guy riding a central Asian camel and throwing scimitars for an attack, but eh, Nostalgia's gonna win on this one. Who cares? The unit is awesome. Beyond the Mameluke, another issue with Saracens is their absolutely awful Castle Age unique tech, Madrasa. I mean, to get any value from the tech, your monks have to die, which is a bad thing. This tech doesn't make you want to lose monks, it just makes the situation where you do lose them slightly less bad. Yeah, this one is just a failed concept in my opinion, and should really just be swapped for something else. Lastly, because the section is already getting pretty long, I just want to mention that I'm never going to be a big fan of their team bonus with the extra damage for archers versus buildings, but at this point, it's balanced enough where I can at least live with it. So there is a lot going on with the Saracens, from their market bonus, to strong camels, to a strong navy, to building killer archers, there's just so much that this sieve can do. Saracens used to be so underwhelming on most map types, but I do believe the changes made in recent years make them flexible enough to earn a something is off rating. Oh boy, we've had three sieves in a row that have needed a lot of discussion, and now we're gonna make that four as we cover our other Lords of the West civilization, the Sicilians. Much like the Burgundians, the Sicilians are controversial in many aspects and not without reason. Still, the sieve does make enough sense to earn a somewhat problematic rating. So interestingly, Sicilians were designated as purely an infantry civilization at launch, but had their title expanded to infantry and cavalry after a semi-recent change which I'll get to in just a bit. Regardless, above all else, the Sicilians are known for their very powerful military bonus of non-siege land units receive 50% less bonus damage. So, for an example, pikemen normally get plus 22 damage versus cavalry units, but when facing Sicilian cavalry, they will only be dealing plus 11 damage. I mentioned the spear line specifically here because when it comes to non-siege land units, these are really the guys that are going to be the most reliant on that bonus damage and are therefore most impacted by that bonus. Still, this bonus is effective against all of the main counter units in the game. Skirmishers, camels, hand cannoneers, certain unique units, and of course, spearmen. All of this is to say that Sicilians can much more comfortably muscle their way through typical unit counters. Beyond their more general military boost, the other Sicilian bonuses help round out the sieve. Economically, they start with 100 stone, receive double the effect of farm upgrades, and build town centers twice as fast. These don't really help you in the dark and feudal age, but from castle age onwards, Sicilians can keep up with most sieves on most maps types. Defensively, the Civ has their unique donjon building, which is essentially a more powerful, more expensive tower, as well as their castles being built twice as fast. Then, when it comes to their own military, Sicilians have middling archers, strong infantry, including an infantry unique unit, great siege, and then extremely tanky knights. Speaking of Sicilian knights, that leads us to the problems with this civilization, of which there are several. A little while ago, Sicilians had their Imperial Age unique tech swapped, as the old one was pretty useless and boring, and it was replaced with the much more useful tech Hoburk, which is essentially an additional plate barding armor that only applies to knights. Now, Sicilians lack paladin, so their cavalier are only slightly better than average in melee fights. However, and this brings me to my second issue, the Sicilian bonus damage resistance so disproportionately affects anti-cavalry units, it just creates this situation where Sicilian cavalier become this one-size-fits-all unit that you can just brainlessly spam versus any army composition. The bigger issue here is that it's really difficult to balance that bonus damage resistance, as lowering the value to less than 50% will make it almost unnoticeable versus anti-archer or anti-infantry units, but its current state does feel a little too good versus anti-cavalry units. Lastly, because again this segment is getting long, I want to briefly mention that I really dislike First Crusade for the same reasons that I dislike Flemish Revolution. It creates a large army out of nowhere and only has a minor long-term effect. Then, their 100% faster building castles also feels a bit overtuned, but once again we run into the sticky balance situation where the bonus needs to feel a lot stronger than the Spanish 30% faster build speed to feel unique. So, with all of that said, are Sicilians completely hopeless? No. I would actually say they have come a long way from where they were at launch. The Civ's general theme of a tanky but lower damage units I think makes plenty of sense. They're viable but not OP on a lot of map types, and I think each patch brings the Civ closer to where it should be. There is still a long way to go, but I believe Sicilians have come far enough to earn that somewhat problematic rating. 
Finally getting a sieve that isn't quite as complicated, we next turn to our very last entry from the Forgotten expansion, the Slavs. Now, Slavs are an interesting sieve. They feel quite powerful in a number of settings, and yet they kind of still fly under the radar. I'm going to go with an almost there rating here. In-game, Slavs are characterized as an infantry and siege civilization, and they certainly are going to bear some similarities to sieves like Celts and Teutons. Probably the most noticeable aspect with this sieve is their powerful eco bonus of farmers working plus 10% fast. Obviously, this is a more long-term bonus that will increase in strength the more farmers you have. However, Slav farmers are always going to be about 10% faster than a generic sieve, which is worse than some other really strong farming sieves from the early to mid-game. But once Handcart comes in, Slavs are always going to come out on top. Militarily, the Slavs are reasonably versatile. They actually get quite strong cavalry, possessing fully upgraded Hussars, Cavalier, and even their Boyar unique unit, which after several buffs over the years, is now fairly similar in strength to a Paladin. Even without a direct military bonus, the fact that the Slavs' strength economically is in food income makes cavalry much easier to produce. Another food-heavy type of unit is infantry, which this Civ also does quite well. Nowadays, you get the supplies upgrade for free, which isn't going to help you in a Drush or men at arms rush, but it will help you better sustain swordsman production from Feudal Age onwards. Yes, swordsmen aren't a very meta choice past early Feudal until you get to post imp, but I do think that Slavs are one of those civs that can really experiment with more infantry-centric strategies. A big part of this is their famous Imperial Age unique tech Druzhina, which allows Slav infantry to deal 5 trample damage, just like Logistica Cataphracts. I love this tech because it really encourages both the Slav player and their opponent to think about how they take fights in a bit of a different way. Beyond that, the has cheap siege units, fairly bad archers, good monks, and no gunpowder. When it comes to maps and game modes, Slavs are definitely going to have noticeable strengths and weaknesses. For open land maps like Arabia, I would say the Civ is above average, being quite good from mid-feudal age onwards, but are nevertheless held back by their lack of strong early game, Bracer, and Arbalest. Closed maps are where the Slavs really shine, as you can go full boom into deadly post-imp quite effectively. On water, they aren't great. So all of what I've been saying sort of paints Slavs as a solid, well-rounded sieve, and they are, mostly. The big reason they don't make the complete tier is their Castle Age unique tech, Orthodoxy, which gives monks plus three plus three armor. This may sound decent in theory, but the tech simply comes in too late to be useful. I know several people that think that Slavs are also kind of a boring sieve, so what I think you can do is you can just make Orthodoxy a sieve bonus, and then you just replace their Castle Age unique tech with something else. In summary, Slavs are just a strong, well-rounded sieve. They've got a good economy, several different options for army compositions, as well as some really fun and unique toys to play with in Druzhna, Cheap Siege, and Boyars. Just need to get that Castle Age tech sorted out, and our totally not Rus Civ is looking good. Now we get to the elder Iberian sister, the Age of Conquerors classic, the Spanish. So this Civ has always been somewhat polarizing when it comes to strengths and weaknesses, so I think this will probably be my most controversial rating of all 39 Civs when I play Spanish in the Almost There tier. As I alluded to earlier, the Spanish are going to be somewhat similar to the Portuguese, with DE classifying them as a gunpowder and monk civilization. Now, Spanish have good gunpowder and monk options, but kind of like Saracens, there's just so much more to this sieve. In fact, by my reckoning, Byzantine, Spanish, and Saracens have the three broadest tech trees in all of AoE 2. Nevertheless, most players will remember the Spanish tech tree for its one gigantic hole, and that is of course the sieve's lack of heated shot. Uh, I mean crossbowmen. But yes, not only do the Spanish miss the crossbowmen upgrade, but they also lack a major economy bonus on most standard settings. That said, the Civ has one of the most powerful unique units in the Conquistador, which are going to be their mounted hand cannoneers. The unit has speed, range, damage, and armor, and is therefore very difficult to stop in the Castle Age, especially since Spanish builders work faster, making their castle drops that much more deadly. However, Conquistadors did receive a small nerf a while back, so now the unit takes extra bonus damage from skirmishers, and as a rule, archers and skirmishers will perform well versus conks. Beyond the castle, the Spanish have a complete barracks, stable except camels, and monastery, and they at least boast faster firing gunpowder options from the archery range and siege workshop. Lastly, all of this is rounded out by the Spanish post-imperial age, where they get super villagers with their supremacy unique tech, as well as notably being the only civ in the game to have full upgrades for all three main trash units, elite skirmishers, halberdiers, and hussars. When it comes to strengths and weaknesses on various map types, this is probably where I'm going to get a lot of flack for my 
high rating. Yes, Spanish are a pretty lousy sieve for 1v1 Arabia in other open maps, but I would counter that by saying that Spanish are at least above average on closed maps, water maps, pocket and team games, and even top tier on Nomad. So really, Spanish perform quite well on most settings, it's just the big one, 1v1 Arabia, where they are lacking. But that's honestly fine to me. Not every sieve has to be a 1v1 Arabia powerhouse, and at least Spanish are not completely hopeless on that map. Still, Spanish are going to miss out on that complete tier due to some small issues. I think objectively the Civ's biggest problem area is their missionary unique unit. Yes, players like the Viper and Survivalist can make them work, but in almost all situations the unit is just straight up inferior to the regular Monk. Missing two range can be somewhat mitigated by the missionary's faster move speed, but ain't nothing making up for their inability to pick up relics, slightly slower conversion speeds, and heal speed that is only 50% as fast as a regular Monk. Yeah, that is way too many things going against the missionary. Nevertheless, Spanish are actually quite a well-rounded civilization. They have a very noticeable identity with their conquistadors, paladins, trade bonus, and even their faster build speed. The Civ thrives on a variety of settings, and is really only lacking on 1v1 open maps or as a flank in a team game. Still, the missionary unit remains a bit of a joke, so that's why Spanish are going to be almost there. Once again, we go to the steppe, as our next civilization will be the last entry from the last Khan's expansion, the Tadars. Despite launching as a fairly underwhelming civilization, a couple years worth of balance changes have done wonders for the Civ, and I actually believe the Tatars are worthy of a complete tier placement. In game, the Tatars are one of two civilizations to be classified as purely focusing on cavalry archers, the other being Mongols who we talked about earlier. And the two civs have plenty of similarities, but as we will see, the Tatars are going to end up being more mid-late game focused. Starting with their economy, the Tatars aren't going to have a super explosive start, as their twin sheep eco bonuses of lasting longer and getting two extra ones whenever additional town centers are created are really really only useful from like the early feudal age through mid castle age. That said, those bonuses are quite helpful during that window as they allow the Tatars player to more gradually transition to farms, as well as ensure that they have enough resources to pull off a fast castle. So yes, those bonuses are nice and all, but where the Tatars really shine is with their military. Most notable amongst the Tatar military bonuses is their unique additional plus 25% damage for all units and buildings when fighting from a higher elevation. Normally in AoE 2, you get plus 25% damage when fighting from the high ground, so Tatars essentially double that effect. In practice, this really helps the Civ lock down strategic points on the map and then hold them against enemy counterattacks. Extra high ground bonus damage is also most useful, or at least most controllable, with ranged units, and hey, that's what Tatars do well. Other than Arbalest, Tatars have access to a full archery range tech tree, as well as free Thumbring and Parthian tactics to really help give you some strong timings. Thumbring in particular is a very expensive tech for early Castle Age, and it gives your crossbowmen the same rate of fire increase as the Ethan. Ethiopian Civ bonus, and for your Cav Archers it gives you the 100% accuracy you need to really be able to use the unit in lower numbers. Their Keshik Unique Unit is an excellent medium cavalry addition to your army, just giving you a cheap option that has actually solid base stats. And then to round things out in the late game, you've got fully upgraded Hussars, Cav Archers, and even Step Lancers that all get an extra plus one plus one armor thanks to their Silk Armor Unique tech. Now as far as maps go, Tatars are just going to be a solid pick in most settings, although they do prefer the more open and aggressive options. Options. In particular, the Civ excels on maps like Gold Rush, or really any setting that favors control of a specific strategic point. Although they aren't amazing on closed maps, they do at least get some late game options like those Cav Archers as well as Bombard Tower, and on water they're just kinda meh. The only thing that gives me a question mark with this Civ is their Flaming Camel Unique Unit. If you guys have never seen these units, you can train them at the castle once you research Timurid Siegecraft, and essentially they're a fast moving petard that only works well versus elephants. I'm not the biggest fan of the unit, but hey, it's a goofy meme unit, and that's clearly what it's intended to be, and so I can live with it. Therefore, Totters will be able to join the complete tier. Next, we revisit the roster of original Age of Kings fan favorites with the Teuton Civilization. They've definitely had their ups and downs over the years, but with some well-targeted changes here and there, I do think Teutons can finally earn a complete rating. In-game, the Teutons are labeled as an infantry civilization, which does seem a little bit off to me. Sure, their infantry is good, but when it comes to overall concept, Teutons are definitely much more of a defensive civilization. I mentioned this in the Korean section of Part 2, but to me, Teutons 
Byzantines, and Koreans are the three most defensively oriented civs in AoE 2, and among those, Teutons are the slow, heavy, powerful melee option, and we see this reflected in a number of ways within their civ bonuses. For their defenses, the Teutons gain an extra 5 garrison space in their towers, and an extra 10 garrison space in their town centers. This not only allows you to shelter more units in the case of an enemy attack, but also enables those buildings to fire additional arrows so long as you have the appropriate amount of units garrisoned. Adding these extra arrows is absolutely critical when it comes to building damage, and this bonus really makes a Teuton position very difficult to break both offensively and defensively. Relatedly, Teutons get the Murder Holes and Herbal Medicine upgrades for free upon hitting the Castle Age. Not a huge deal most of the time, but those are still two defensive technologies that are just nice to have for free. Then lastly for their defenses, the Imperial Age Teuton Unique Tech Crenellations gives their castles plus three range, allowing them to match the range of Bombard Cannons and non-elite Cannon Galleons. Also, Garrisoned Infantry can fire arrows, which is nice. Militarily, Teutons are all about slow, powerful units with plenty of melee armor. I mean, their Castle Age Unique Tech is literally called Ironclad, and it gives your Siege units plus four melee armor. This complements their Civ bonus of extra melee armor for their Barracks and Stable units, giving Teutons very potent champions, halberdiers, and paladins. Of course, this does come at the cost of speed, as the Teutons are notably one of the very few civilizations to lack the husbandry technology, and they're the only Civ in the game that has access to cavalry that misses the Light Cav upgrade. And then to top that all off, their famous Teutonic Knight unique unit is the slowest, most expensive, highest damage, and most heavily armored infantry unit in AoE 2. When it comes to maps, Teutons definitely have their preferences, and that is going to be any sort of closed map. Speed is not something this Civ excels at, so being able to use the map architecture to force fights with your opponent really lends itself to the Teuton gameplay. Open maps can be a bit trickier, but there still are situations where Teutons can force these sort of slow, focused pushes, and in those situations, Teutons can still be difficult to stop. The only map type where they really struggle is on water. So yeah, don't play Teutons on islands. Overall, Teutons are definitely one of the most recognizable civs in AoE 2. Part of that is the Barbarossa campaign, part of that is the Teutonic Knight, but I would argue that part of it is also the very distinct playstyle of the civ. I mean, when you play the Teutons, you better get ready to just grind your opponents down into dust. Now down to our final three, we next look at one of the most polarizing civilizations in all of AoE 2, the Turks, who are of course another Age of Kings classic. In my opinion, this Civ used to be in a really rough state, but are at least now a bit more level, and at least earn a somewhat problematic rating? Well, when it comes to identity, there is absolutely no ambiguity with the Turks. In-game, they are classified as a gunpowder civilization, which, uh, yeah, that checks out. To be fair, they also do the whole light cav and cav archer sort of step thing quite well, but gunpowder is definitely the main show. To summarize, Turks get plus 25% HP for gunpowder units, free chemistry, the almost completely archaic 50% cheaper gunpowder upgrades, their artillery unique tech, which grants plus two range to bombard towers, bombard cannons, and cannon galleons, and finally a team bonus of gunpowder units producing 25% faster. Oh yeah, their unique unit, the Janissary, is a powerful general purpose hand cannoneer. When it comes to helping you get there, Turks also get 20% faster working gold miners, which is a pretty important resource when it comes to getting to all of that expensive technology. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, Turks are kind of like Magyars in being a sort of post-step sieve. Their scout line is top tier with free light cav and hussar upgrades, as well as a permanent plus one pierce armor to their scouts at all ages. For the Turk cav archers, when they are fully upgraded with their Sapahi unique tech, they get a whopping 100 HP. So with all of that in mind, where are the Turks good? Well, they are always going to be a strong contender on closed maps, where they're plethora of deadly long-ranged options in the late game can be very difficult to stop. In particular, the Janissary's high damage in 8 range combined to create a truly deadly unit in situations where mobility isn't a major factor. We see castle drops a lot with the Turks. Of course, Turks famously have two very obvious problems. They are the only Civ to miss the Pikeman upgrade, as well as the Elite Skirmisher upgrade. Yeah, that not only makes Turks quite suspect in Trash Wars, but also in any situation where you get your gold or even stone denied. The Civ is just so reliant on gold income that they can feel pretty inconsistent to play. Now, the lack of pikemen can be mitigated by camels to some degree, and Turks are usually alright versus cavalry civs. Elite Skirmisher being missing, however, is a huge deal in many matchups, as skirms are an important part of Feudal Age and Early Castle Age armies. Missing such an important upgrade gives strong archer civs like Britons and Mayans an enormous window in the Early Castle Age to just wreck you. So yeah, Turks are in 
indeed a somewhat problematic sieve. Like the Goths, Turks just have a very polarizing matchup spread, being absolutely dominant in some situations and very sad in others. Even within a game, the lack of two-thirds of the trash unit upgrades causes Turks to be one of the most susceptible sieves to having a bad map where you just have forward golds and stones. That said, unlike Goths, Turks do have certain settings where they really shine, aka closed maps, and even feature two very distinct playstyles of the gunpowder route and the hussar slash cav archer route. Therefore, Turks will get that bump up a tier to somewhat problematic. Moving now to our penultimate sieve, we find ourselves with the last entry from the Rise of the Rajah's expansion, the Vietnamese. This sieve used to be absolutely terrible at launch, but through several buffs over the years, they're actually now quite a competitive option. That said, Vietnamese still face some very obvious design issues, so they're still going to land in the somewhat problematic tier. In the tech tree, the Vietnamese are listed as an archer civilization, which is certainly an accurate characterization. In looking at the foot archer-centric civilizations, we have Britons with their long range, Mayans focusing on cost efficiency, Ethiopians prioritizing raw damage, and then the Vietnamese rounding out the crew by relying on tankiness and defenses. In many ways, Vietnamese can be seen as an anti-archer archer sieve, but going beyond that, they're just a very defensive and late game oriented civilization. Much of this identity is going to revolve around their main military bonus of plus 20% HP to all archery range units, as well as their two unique units, the Rattan Archer and the Imperial Skirmisher, both of which excel at dealing with enemy ranged units. Still, beyond archers, Vietnamese do have some other options. Their knowledge of where the enemy TCs are located can be quite helpful on certain maps, and yes, laming included. Their eco is solid with their bonus of eco upgrades not costing wood, and free conscription is surprisingly helpful in the early Imperial Age. Militarily, again, beyond the whole archers thing, Vietnamese have passable infantry and cavalry, average siege, and below average monks. That said, some of the most powerful non-archer options for Vietnamese are going to be their battle elephants, which can get over 400 HP, as well as their access to bombard cannons and bombard towers to help with those sort of slow, grindy late game pushes. Still, the Vietnamese do have problems, and this is going to be kind of weird to talk about because the Civ is overall pretty well balanced and possesses a distinct identity. Regardless, first on the chopping block is the Vietnamese team bonus. I am totally fine with the Imperial Skirmisher as a unit, and I think it fits in well with the Vietnamese, but there is no reason that it should be a team unit as opposed to a Civ specific one. In almost every single single team game setting, if you're making mass skirmishers in Imperial Age, you're probably already losing, and imp skirms don't really change that dynamic whatsoever. What makes this whole situation even more irritating is that the Vietnamese have a great team bonus already, their whole revealing the enemy TC location thing. In practice, this leads to only the Vietnamese player seeing where the enemy TCs are at the start of a game, so they constantly have to ping their allies who cannot see what the Vietnamese player can. It's just really clunky and should be 100% switched. The second major issue with the Vietnamese is their Imperial Age unique tech, the infamous Paper Money, which is a one-time infusion of 500 gold for every team member. As an immediate effect, that is already quite underwhelming, but to not have any sort of long-term benefit after that, that's just terrible, man. As I have said many times throughout this series, one-time effect techs are not my favorite, and Paper Money is just one that needs a complete rework. Still, even with those issues, like I said, Vietnamese do have their niche in AoE too. They're a strong archer save with a decent economy and a focus on defense and the late game. On open maps, Vietnamese are solid, and they're even a bit better on closed maps. All around, kind of an underrated sieve in my opinion, but still possess enough issues to earn a somewhat problematic placement. And now, our very last civilization alphabetically, the Vikings. As this civ is another Age of Kings fan favorite, it means that Vikings have actually always been the last civilization on the civ select screen. Anyway, these guys have been a bit controversial, and although they could be in a good spot right now, I'm going to be on the conservative side and put the Vikings in the almost there tier. So the Vikings are described in game as an infantry and naval civilization, and yes, those are certainly accurate designations, but I'd say the Vikings are most famous for their economy on pretty much any land map. This sieve has just one of the most powerful eco bonuses in the entire game, as well as one of the easiest to use, and that is of course their free wheelbarrow and handcart upgrades. This may seem minor, but in practice, these upgrades provide a significant boost to your farming speed, as well as a much smaller boost to worker efficiency in pretty much every other area. This alone is an excellent boost, but because you research those two upgrades at the town center, you also have to factor in the saved TC work time, which is 
additionally going to be giving the Viking player a relative three villager advantage when their opponent researches Wheelbarrow, and then another two-ish villager lead once Handcart comes in. Of course, this bonus is not permanent, as once those techs come in, you don't really have any long-term boost as the Vikings. So with this awesome eco on land maps in mind, what exactly do they do? Well, Vikings are balanced by having a generally lousy tech tree, possessing some of the worst cavalry and monks in the game, missing key gunpowder units, as well as only having average archers. The archer thing has been a bit of a sticky point in the community recently, as many players felt that the Viking fast Imperial Age Arbalest timing was simply too strong. So to tune that strategy down, as well as to refocus the Vikings back to infantry, the devs removed the thumb ring technology for the Vikings. To compensate, Vikings now get their full plus 20% infantry HP bonus starting from the Feudal Age instead of being staggered, as well as a massive buff to Castle Age Berserks. I would say the jury is still out as to whether this is a net buff or nerf to the Civ, but Vikings remain a powerful pick on any open or semi-open maps. In particular, any map where you can go fast castle into aggression is going to be great for Vikings. On the water, Vikings used to be more or less the only Civ before the Forgotten rebalanced the Water Triangle. Still, even in the world of fire galleys and demo rafts, Vikings remain a top pick on many different water maps. Their cheaper docks help them get going in the Dark Age and Early Feudal Age, and their warship discount allows the Viking player to more easily outmass their opponent with galleys or longboats. Speaking of which, Vikings do get a naval unique unit in the longboat, which is similar to the galley line in most respects, but still possesses a noticeable distinction in that longboats are more expensive, more nimble warships when compared to their generic brethren. Also, because they fire multiple arrows, longboats are much better than galleys against fire ships, which is nice. Nevertheless, Vikings are going to be doing much better on more boomy water maps like Islands and Migration, where the rush distance between players is going to be much longer, giving the Viking player the time they need to amass enough galleys to deal with the enemy fire galleys. All in all, the Vikings are in a pretty good spot. They've got distinct playstyles on both land and water, have some memorable unique units, and are generally well balanced. I honestly could put them in the complete tier, and maybe I would in a couple months. I just personally want to see more games with this Civ with all of their recent changes before I give them the Ornlu stamp of approval. And with that, we've placed all 39 civilizations currently in AoE 2 DE. As you can see with the whole distribution of civs within the tier list, I honestly believe that a majority of the civs are either in a good spot right now, or are at least getting there. Of course, there is still plenty of work that needs to be done in my opinion, but I still think it's important to underscore just how far we have collectively come when it comes to creating an increasingly huge roster of diverse and balanced civilizations. But like I said at the beginning of this video, everything I discussed here is 100% subjective, so please let me know what you guys think of the civs we covered today, as well as your overall thoughts on the tier list and this series in general. And lastly, as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time!